Hello, and welcome to Acting Lessons Learned. I'm Tawana Floyd, your host. If you're returning, welcome back. There is a special place in my heart for you. And if this is your first time, welcome and thanks for choosing this podcast. I appreciate you all for dropping in to spend some time with me. And as a quick reminder of what I do here, I share the lessons I've learned while pursuing an acting career in Los Angeles, a little bit in New York, but mostly in Los Angeles. Today, I'll share the first time I terminated an agent, what led to the decision, how I handled it, and how I moved on, sharing a series of tentpole events and lessons learned leading up to the termination. I should preface that at the time of this story, which was 2006 to 2007, SAG, the Screen Actors Guild, and AFTRA, the American Federation of TV and Radio Artists, were separate unions. The SAG-AFTRA merger hadn't occurred yet. So I'll be saying SAG in this episode because that's what it was then. In my 16 years of living in LA, I have terminated nine representatives, That is a combined total of commercial, print, and theatrical agents and two managers. I'm not a proponent of changing reps often. I recognize that building collaborative relationships and finding a groove takes time. My preference is to grow old in a partnership like Tom Cruise and his manager, but I haven't gotten there yet. Maybe it's a new day. Maybe it will never happen, but that remains to be seen. My first termination was unexpected for both parties because things were going so well. And then we hit a crossroads. I know a lot of actors who have had to terminate their reps for deplorable behaviors, non and ill communication, and monetary theft. Now that sucks. And I am so thankful that my reasons for leaving my past reps were based on level up business moves. After completing my Meisner training, I was eager to find an agent, start auditioning, and begin the working actor track. Most actors, myself included, believe getting an agent to be the first and best move after training. There are two schools of thought on this. Some say, wait and find work on your own. Build a resume. Others say, do it immediately. The agent will procure opportunities for you. I subscribe to both. Get an agent and procure my own opportunities. I think it's wise to get an agent if the actor is clear about their career trajectory and can find a representative in alignment with those goals. I think it's detrimental to an actor's success when they stay in a bad situation too long. Perhaps not so wise to get an agent right away when neither of you knows what it is that you want. Either way, the actor still learns a great deal from both experiences. I'd like to think I was clear on my career plans when I first moved to L.A., but I wasn't 100% clear in retrospect. I didn't know all that was possible, and because representation didn't matter in 2006, I didn't have a lot of proof of what was possible then. But what I knew for sure was this. I wanted to be a commercial actor. I attended the Fashion Institute of Technology for Advertising and Marketing because I love marketing and advertising. I had met a few commercial actors while working in sales in Bergdorf Goodman in New York City, They'd share how lucrative commercials could be. And I loved commercials. I'm the person who will watch all the commercials and get mad if someone turns the channel during a commercial. So it made sense, pun intended, for me to pursue commercials. I started reading all the working actor books and learned a few things like it was quicker for a non-union actor to get a commercial agent than a theatrical agent because theatrical agents weren't as willing to take a gamble on a developmental actor as a commercial agent would. That commercial auditions were plentiful and frequent, and I'd have more opportunities to audition and book commercial roles than I would television and film. I read that avid commercial auditioning would increase my confidence and make me a proficient actor adept at on-the-spot script analysis and quick decision-making. But the biggest draw to commercials was financial sustainability. Once I discovered that I could earn a lot of money and have a lot of time to pursue my acting without a survival job, I was in. And did I mention that I love commercials? I love commercials. I sought both commercial and theatrical representation. Theatrical office, 
I didn't respond. (laughs) I did have a manager for a short period, but I was represented by two commercial agents. Some states allowed actors to have multiple agents in the same discipline, and New York is one of those states. Those two ladies kept me busy with plenty of non-union commercial opportunities, but I was never offered a chance to audition for a union SAG commercial. To give you an idea of potential earnings and discrepancies between union and non-union work, non-union jobs, while a satisfactory way for new actors to find their grounding, is always a termed buyout of several thousand dollars and a proper agent will always renegotiate more. The non-union actor is usually treated like a second-class citizen, undervalued, no boundaries on our time. We could work like a 16-hour session with minimal breaks, a subpar meal, and no paid overtime because it was included in the buyout. No pension or health options, fundamentally an independent contractor. However, a union SAG member receives well-negotiated scale rates for an eight-hour session with incremental overtime pay, proper meal breaks, hot meals. Then when the spot airs, the actor gets residual income for each airing. Those earnings fund pension and health insurance, and a minimum earning threshold allows qualifying actors to be eligible for health insurance. But occasionally, the actor may not make the final cut, which means no residuals for them, but the treatment is still much better. I desire to become eligible to join SAG, which was a catch-22. To become eligible, I'd have to work a union franchise job, but in order to work a union franchise job, I would have to be invited to a SAG commercial audition, which didn't occur often. The second option was to receive three SAG vouchers from working as an extra, now called background. Thousands of background actors vie for three vouchers. It could take five, ten years for most people to receive all three. For a lucky few, it happens quicker, but productions tend to get a limited amount of vouchers per episode. It's the equivalent of winning the lottery, and I don't play the lottery. I've even witnessed young, beautiful girls flirt with the male assistant directors on sets and get their vouchers quickly, but I'm pretty certain that ends up costing them more than they've bargained for. And the third way is through the backdoor system. If you were a member of another union like AFTRA or Actors' Equity and you booked a job with Lines, you could join SAG using the backdoor system after 12 months. I was AFTRA and I was trying to book a show with Lines, but remember, none of the theatrical agents I reached out to responded. I also worked background, but never enough to make even one voucher. So I told myself, I'll become SAG eligible by being Taft-Hartley from a commercial, which is challenging, but to me was not as difficult as those three vouchers. For those who don't know, a Taft-Hartley is a report filed with SAG-AFTRA. A SAG signatory producer hires an actor who does not currently belong to the union. The company or casting director must explain why the non-union actor was chosen for the job over a union actor, but the Taft-Hartley makes the non-union actor SAG eligible. I worked a part-time non-industry job on weekends to supplement my income while I'd frequently book non-union commercials, but the $3,000 to $5,000 two to three year buyout wasn't moving the needle quickly enough. My New York City agents were solely getting me non-union commercials. It's possible they weren't interested in obtaining sad commercial auditions on my behalf because the agents of non-union actors receive 20% commission from the actor and 20% commission from the commercial. For SAG bookings, the agent gets 10% of the actor's earnings. Now, you may think 10% isn't really much and the 20-20% model is probably a better idea, but on paper, it's not. A thriving agency with top SAG actors will make more money from the 10% of their consistently booking actors' earnings. They can keep their roster smaller, which in turn means less work and less manpower. An agency focused on the non-union 2020 commission model will tend to have five times more actors on their roster to make a surplus of dollars. They're constantly renegotiating deals, which takes a lot of time and energy, and it requires more work and more manpower. And the actor suffers because the relationship with those agents are usually shallow. Let me give you an example with some actual numbers. 
If agency A has 100 SAG actors and 50 of those 100 SAG actors earn $1 million in a quarter, that agency makes $100,000 from a 10% commission. If agency B has 400 non-union actors and 50 of that 400 non-union actors earn $100,000 in a quarter, that agency makes $40,000 from the 2020 commission model. They have 400 actors because the rates on non-union commercials are nominal. So I think you can see why I wanted to be a SAG member. Now bear with me. This podcast is about terminating my first agent, but all of this talk around SAG was the impetus for why I left. I didn't need to terminate my agents in New York because I migrated to Los Angeles and those relationships ended with a thank you for everything and a bon voyage. When I arrived in LA in 2005, I had to start from the beginning again. I subconsciously knew if I did it once, I could surely do it again. But my plan was rocked by the vastness of Hollywood. The plan was to work a full-time job for three months and be booking non-union commercials by the fourth month, then become SAG within a year and quit my job altogether. But three months was not enough. I needed more time to learn the culture and the lay of the land of L.A. before I began my actor journey. So from 2005 to 2007, I worked a full-time, high-stress, demanding sales job that I hated. I would get home after a nine-hour day with no energy remaining to focus on my actor strategy. I was resentful that I was back in the rat race. I was broke and struggling, and I didn't like it. And because the cost of living in L.A. was considered less than in New York City, I wasn't earning enough to live comfortably. I had already lived an artist's life in New York City and was prepared to make it happen in L.A. And so after almost two years and the job I hated, I quit. No backup plan. My backup plan was to start focusing on commercials. I gave my boss a generous three-month notice, mainly because salary aside, he was very supportive of me in so many ways, and the position was hard to fill. I was an avid postcard marketer, thanks to my education at Fashion Institute of Technology, working commission sales at Neiman Marcus, and an actress named Nicole Noel. Shout out to Nicole Noel, who put me onto mailing postcards to casting directors way back in the day while doing background on the film New Jersey Drive. I decided to do a mass mailing to all the commercial agents here in L.A., And because I wasn't a graphic designer in 2007, I designed a postcard with my headshot name and telephone number using Microsoft Word. Yeah, you heard that right. It was not easy, but I got it done. And then I printed 100 copies at Staples and mailed them out. From the 100 offices I submitted to, I received three offers to meet. One office was a modeling agency, which I almost declined the meeting because I wasn't looking to model, but upon further research, I discovered they had just opened a commercial division. It was the first meeting I took in L.A. They occupied a cute boutique office in a prevalent part of Beverly Hills. I was impressed by the recognizable models they represented, and I was thrilled that it was owned by a black woman who had just appeared on a Tyra Banks then talk show. I met with the new head of commercials. She was very California. True religion jeans, blonde hair, bright blue eyes, bubbly and friendly. She was ambitious and very excited about me. She explained the L.A. market and informed me that she operated on a handshake. And if at any point it wasn't a fit, we would amicably part ways. We spoke about my goals as a commercial actor discussing the possibilities and realities of my desire to become SAG eligible. I informed her that I wanted to be submitted for union auditions, and she said she'd do her part to make it happen. I found the no contract part suspect. I was excited, yet leery, questioning the validity of the no contract policy. She offered to rep me, told me to give it some thought, and call or email her if I had further questions. Thankfully, at the time, I was in a commercial class with Stuart K. Robinson. 
I was profoundly fortunate to have found him in the early stages of my career. He was a phenomenal teacher in so many ways. He was wildly enthusiastic, an outstanding educator, astutely knowledgeable about the workings of Hollywood. He was once a thriving commercial actor, and he encouraged his students to believe we could not only book commercials, but that we could book multiple commercials. He truly set me up for success. I told him about my offer and my concerns about not having a contract. With his endearing smile, he informed me it was not only commonplace with some agencies to do a handshake deal, but it was a win-win for me. That if I found the agency to not be a fit, I didn't have to worry about breaking a contract after a few months. On that advice, I accepted the offer to join the Beverly Hills Agency. My new Beverly Hills agent kept me busy with auditions, which posed problems with attempting to go during lunch breaks. My boss was always annoyed that I'd leave for lunch early and come back late. But I wasn't about to cancel appointments. I couldn't prioritize the job that I hated over commercial opportunities. I had to generate income as that three-month notice was fast approaching. I was fired up and my New York energy was contagious. I booked the first non-union commercial my Beverly Hills agent sent me and began booking non-union jobs at a nice pace. But the buyout rates had declined that it wasn't sustainable. Then, one day, my Beverly Hills agent called me with a time slot for my first union commercial audition. It was straight to callbacks. I had never been requested to a second round audition before. I asked Stuart K. Robinson what this meant. He informed me that if the commercials director didn't see the talent they desired to hire in the first round of auditions, they'd request the casting director bring in new talent for the callback. I showed up to the audition. I was second to last to go in. The director was in the room with the producer and the commercials clients. I was paired with a young boy. The director gave the young boy and me an explanation of what he wanted to see from us. The young boy and I played it out, but this kid was not enthused to be there. (sighs) Sometimes a child actor isn't interested in being an actor, but the parents force their child to act because they want to earn college money. Sometimes it's just been a long day for the kid, or the child is hungry, or maybe angry with their parents, or just not a good actor yet. But what sucks about all of these things is that kid can cost the other actors in the room the possibility of booking the job. The young boy's performance never elevated. I was, I was so annoyed. I had to cover my annoyance. I had a lot on the line with this audition. The possibility of the booking, the possibility of earning money as I quit the job I hated, becoming SAG, and who knew when I'd be invited to audition for a union job again. With one young child's disinterest, all possibilities were extinguished. Once it was over, I didn't have time to sit in the upset. I had to rush back to the job that I hated because the session ran long. By the time my shift ended, I had released my bitterness around the failed callback. While driving home from work, I received the call from the Beverly Hills agent that I was on a veil, which meant I was in contention for the booking of the role. My Beverly Hills agent prompted me that I not get excited yet, that when a union job considers a non-union actor, the producer of the commercial must taft heartly the non-union actor, rendering them SAG eligible. But I knew all of this, as I mentioned earlier. And then she told me the producer would be charged a fine for hiring a non-union actor. And in her experience, Most producers found this to be a nuisance and would most times choose the union actor. That I did not know. (sighs) The union was notoriously hard to join. I chalked it up to more bureaucracy to keep me from joining SAG. And a few days later, I received the news. They booked me. I was so surprised, excited. I joyously shouted so loud, scaring all the people around me. I called my mother immediately. She knew exactly what this meant. I had been talking to her about national commercials for years. This booking came in July 2007, which was the final month of the three-month notice. On the day of the shoot, I arrived to set and I met the most adorable little boy who was playing my son. His name was Lucky. He loved acting. He and his mom had just moved to L.A. from Florida so that he could pursue his dream to become an actor. 
We had both booked a national good nights commercial. It didn't feel like work. The atmosphere of this union job was fun, lighter. The spot didn't run right away, but when it did, I paid off all my debt and reinvested in my career. I was finally eligible and able to join SAG. But once you join SAG, you can only work union jobs. So I didn't join right away because I felt I still had more growing to do in my craft. I needed to build my resume. A year after the union commercial, I was over non-union buyouts and the sneaky imperpetuity clauses slyly put into the contract. My Beverly Hills agent always negotiated a clear-termed buyout with a set rate and time frame. Then I'd arrive to set and read the contract and see that clause in there. I became the only actor on these non-union sets refusing to sign contracts with that clause. And because I was the only actor on set causing a stalemate, I became the problem actor. I even walked off of a set one time. This hassle occurred too often for my peace of mind. The constant battle incited me to overcome my fears of inadequacy and join SAG. I had stayed current with SAG's current state of affairs. The commercial contract was up for renewal. It was rumored that collective bargaining with the producers was not being met by SAG's standards. A strike was pending, and while no one wanted a strike, I so appreciated SAG's stance on fighting for more wages for its members. In March 2008, I went to the SAG offices on Wilshire Boulevard, paid my membership fee, and joined because I was sick and tired of non-union producers getting my talent at a severely reduced rate while treating me like crap. Joining SAG was an uneventful moment. I had waited years to become eligible. The process was sterile. I went to a cashier's window, paid the lady behind the glass, she gave me a receipt, went about her business, and that was it. That's it? No congratulations, no balloons, or at the very least a handful of paper punch of confetti blown in my face. No pomp and circumstances? I don't know, I just felt there should have been a little more celebration or consideration for my efforts. <sighs> Nonetheless, I was a newly minted SAG member. So proud of myself, overflowing with merriment, I rushed home to email my Beverly Hills agent. I did it, I typed. I joined SAG. You can no longer submit me for non-union jobs. I'm a SAG member under the Global Rule 1. I must only work jobs under the SAG contract. My Beverly Hills agent replied rather quickly. I expected her to congratulate and celebrate me and step up where SAG dropped the ball and discuss new tactics and new strategies of how we were going to move forward. Instead, her response was a fear-mongered disappointment, stating that she wished I had conferred with her first, that she didn't think it was wise to join at that moment, that I'd be losing out on too many non-union ops that the union was possibly going to strike and my opportunities would diminish because so many girls in my category will book SAG commercials before me. Remember that 2020 commission model that I mentioned earlier? Now, I didn't know this then, but I suspect that my Beverly Hills agent may have been looking out for her double-dipping commissions instead of my best wishes. At first, I was frightened and devastated, thinking I had made the wrong decision, that she was mad at me, that I was a stupid actor for not consulting with her first because, of course, she would know best. And then I became so enraged, infuriated. How dare she drop her true religion jeans to her ankles and take a squat and shit on my parade? When I make a decision, it has been well thought out. This Beverly Hills agent's response revealed she didn't actually believe in my ability. It felt like she wanted to keep me small, but I didn't move to L.A. to play small. And I didn't come to L.A. to be bullied into someone else's ideals of what's best for my career. I went for a walk because I needed to cool off. And on that walk, I decided I was going to respectfully tell my Beverly Hills agent how I felt. When I got back home, I sent an email stating how disappointed I was in her response that I knew SAG was considering a strike, how I had carefully considered joining SAG because of the constant in perpetuity non-union contracts. I supported the purpose of SAG's pending strike because they were now fighting for my future. And as an agent, I expected her support in my decision to take my career to the next level. Now, I don't know who I thought I was in that moment, 
but I knew I had to speak up for myself, even if that meant my Beverly Hills agent would drop me. Surprisingly, she replied with an apology and said that she did support me and she would move me over to the union side. I valued her apology, the integrity behind it. But it was clear to me that we didn't share the same vision of elevating my career. I felt she didn't believe I can consistently earn a living from national commercials. I solemnly decided it was time to go. I had made a quantum leap by joining SAG, and I wanted to be represented by an agent with vision. In that moment, I looked at the list of agents I kept in my journal. This time, I only chose five offices. All five were larger agencies than my Beverly Hills agent. I wrote powerful, succinct cover letters for each office, putting the letter, headshot, and resume into a large orange 9 by 12 envelope. I walked to the post office, purchased postage, and mailed them off. I continued, in the meantime, to work with my Beverly Hills agent. A few weeks later, I received a call from one of the offices I had submitted to. They wanted to schedule a meeting with the company's CEO. I showed up prepared with a list of questions to interview this potential new agent. This office was in Universal City. It had an executive feel to it. The assistant escorted me to the back offices where I met the new executive lady agent sitting at a grand wooden desk, impeccably dressed, elegant, and sophisticated. She was a bold speaker, petite and powerful. It was an extraordinary meeting. This executive lady agent took charge and allowed space for me to ask questions. Her thoughts on my union status sealed the deal that this would be my new commercial home. She said verbatim, non-union commercial is a small change. There's no money there. It's an excellent place to start for new actors, but we prefer to get actors booked in union commercials sooner than later. It's a win for everyone. And we prefer if our actors don't have to struggle. They just have to take their career seriously. I almost cried. She told me that she'd love to have me for her roster. Three days later, I decided to sign with the new executive lady agent. Thankfully, that no contract policy with my Beverly Hills agent made it easy for me to move on to my next commercial home where I'd spend eight years earning a lot of SAG national commercial dollars. My Beverly Hills agent was sad to see me go and left me with kind parting words. SAG did not go on strike that year, but the writers did, and afterwards, SAG was in a stalemate. Both of those events did cripple the industry, but once it was over, it was back to even better business, and I believe creatives should be paid and paid well. I have never regret my decision to join SAG at the time that I did. People always ask me, ask me, when's the best time for them to join a union? And I will never, ever give an answer telling someone when's the best time for them to join the union. You have to know for yourself. You have to pay attention to your business model and figure out what works best for you. Sometimes we receive signs that tell us it's time to go. It's time to make a move. I don't believe I overstayed my time with the Beverly Hills agent. The moment she revealed we were no longer in alignment, I left. And that was a big lesson learned that I continue to use as a barometer of when it's time to go. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you learned anything new, I invite you to subscribe to this podcast. The numbers help me make impressions that can later turn into dollars to fund this labor of love. You can also follow me at Acting Lessons Learned on Instagram. Check me out at my website at TawanaFloyd.com. And join me in two weeks where I'll share how I booked my first co-star. Until then, thanks for listening. And remember to always follow your intuition because it always knows best.